I've never shared this with anyone on YouTube, but there's actually a little room back behind my shop tool wall. And from outside my shop, you can see that there's not even a door to get into it. Or is there? When I finished my basement years ago, I really wanted to incorporate a hidden room because I thought it would just be cool. So this bookcase opens up and you can get into the little room that's behind my shop. It's 8 feet wide and 12 feet long and I finished it out with drywall, a couple of electric outlets and some track lighting. It was the perfect secret showroom for all of my Golden Girls VHS tapes. Actually, it ended up just being for cushion storage, but now I'd really like to convert it into a recording studio. I figured it would get a lot of use between all the voiceovers for my YouTube videos and for the weekly podcast episodes that I record. This should give me a convenient space to do it all in, but I'd need to do something about the echoey sound in there first. And then I want to outfit it with an illuminated sign and a new desk. All right, this should be a fun, stress-free build, right? The first thing that I'll knock out is the nasty reverb that I get in here. And to address that, I picked up a bunch of these little foam acoustic panels. I ended up ordering like 350 of them to do this entire room. And to hang them up, I decided to use adhesive spray. I just figured command strips would probably cost a fortune and double-sided tape wouldn't really adhere to the foam all that well and those little T-shaped pins would require me to hammer them through the drywall. But this adhesive spray worked perfectly and it was a cinch to use. All in all, it took me just several hours to get the walls completely covered. I'd just spray a light coat on the back of the foam panel, another light coat on the wall, and after letting them tack up a bit, I'd just put it in place and press it down. Then for the areas where there was an overhang, I'd just run my knife down the edge and shave off the excess. And there you have it. It turned out great and I didn't have any issues. Well, except for all the adhesive fumes in the small enclosed space. I forgot my own name there for a while, but I'm good now. So the first thing that I wanted to make was a simple illuminated sign of the logo for my podcast. I thought that this would make for some good looking wall art that would add some flair to the studio. The idea I had was to create it multi-layered, so for the first layer, I'll be using a light-colored species that I've only worked with once before, and that's butternut. I put a couple of pieces through the planer to get them down to the right thickness, and then I could put them together into a panel. All right, what's up? Then for the second layer, I went darker. I did the same thing, but with a bunch of very necessary walnut. Now I could put them on the CNC and cut out the shapes. And to do that, I'm going to be using my favorite quarter-inch compression end mill. This bit is called the Jenny, and it's made by Cadence Manufacturing and Design. Even Tommy Two-Tone approves of the part number of this thing. But just look at how close the compression flutes are to the end of the bit. Cadence truly makes the best CNC bits I've ever used, and I'll be honest, they're the only ones I'm going to buy going forward. And just to be clear, yes, I'm an affiliate of Cadence, but no. This is not a sponsored video. I'm, I'm not getting paid to say this. I'm just giving you a heads up on a great company that makes quality CNC bits. And if you find yourself buying some, use Fisher 10 as a coupon code and you'll save yourself 10%. You'll find the entire line of Jenny bits over at his website, cadencemfgdesign.com. Well, the butternut cut, well, like butter. And in just a few minutes, I had the back panel completed. Next, I did the same thing with the walnut, and I cut out the podcast logo. And once that was done, I broke all the tabs and was able to remove the outer frame. Now, I thought I could make this look even more cool by adding some LED lights to the back to give it a glow around the border of the logo. So I picked up a cheap set of lights, and I did my best to center them on the back of the piece. And testing the lights. Oh, that looks good. Next, I needed to glue on some spacer blocks to hold the logo out from the backer piece. Then once I had those on, I could put it in place and transfer those locations onto the back. At this point, I could drill some mounting holes all the way through the backer. And another larger hole for the power cable. Then on the back, I could countersink the mounting holes and screw on a couple hanger brackets with flathead screws, of course. 
Now at this point, I could put it back together and then continue drilling the mounting holes through the existing ones up into the spacer blocks on the other side. All right, now we're ready for some finish. And for that, I just rubbed on some Danish oil real quick and then I could put this thing together. Some finish for the front of the logo and then this thing was done. Time to hang it up. I found a spot between the acoustic tiles to put in a couple of wall anchors and then I could put this thing up on display. And what's cool is that I managed to hide the power cord by tucking it down between the foam panels all the way from the outlet to the finished piece on the wall. And there it is. It's so cool. Well, I think it is at least. And I love that I can easily turn it on and off and change the colors with the remote. That's awesome. But that's just a start. Now I need to make a desk. So for that, I picked up this gorgeous slab of honey locust from my friend Ron who runs High Grade Lumber. If you're in Michigan and you need some top shelf stuff, then check them out. I've got nothing but good things to say about high grade lumber. Now, since I was going to be using epoxy and this particular slab was sporting two big knot holes, they needed to be cleared out. This means that I got to use some chisels and awls and whatever else it takes to dig out all the bark and the loose bits from both sides. I wanted this slab to have natural looking ends though, and not the straight edge from the chainsaw. So I drew on some wavy lines and then trimmed the ends with my jigsaw. Next, I put my turbo plane in my angle grinder and I started to shape the edges of the slab. In some places, I just removed the weathered exterior, but in others, I took some creative liberty and I rounded over the edges, adding some unique natural looking shapes to give it character and to make it look well, to, to make it look more like me, because I've developed some seriously round edges lately. Once I was through with that, I swapped out the attachments for a flap disc sander, and then I smoothed out all the rough edges that the turboplane left. And this did a good job, but I still needed to go back and hit all the edges again with some hand sanding. Now it's time for something I've never done before. Resawing a piece of wood on the bandsaw while completely nude and inlaying bow ties. I've never done that before either. So to make the bow ties, I figured I'd be a big fat cheater and just use the CNC machine. I drew the shape of a small bow tie and then another that's slightly bigger and I had the machine cut out two of each. I trimmed off the excess at the miter saw and then I could cut the bow ties out by running it through the bandsaw again. Now I can place them out on the slab where I wanted them to end up. Now to inlay them, the first step I took was to trace around each one with an X-Acto knife. Once that was done, I could remove the bow tie and then accentuate the cuts with a chisel so that they were much more pronounced. After that, I got surgical with a trim router. I put in a small quarter inch straight bit and I hogged away as much material as I could without hitting my chiseled lines. Then I'd increase the depth and do it all again. I did this a total of three times, working my way down to a depth of about a half inch. Next, I had to chisel out the remainder of the material. Then I figured it would be easier to insert into the mortise if the bottom of each bow tie had just a tiny chamfer on its edges. Now I can spread some glue, start it out with some little taparoos, and then send it home. There was still quite a bit above the surface though, so I used my hand plane to shave it down close to flush and then I just sanded it the rest of the way. Now since this was my first time with epoxy, I actually read the instructions. And they suggested to start with a sealer coat to minimize air bubbles. So I painted on a thin coat all around the insides of the voids. I also figured it would be a genius idea to create a dam around each hole and crack using hot glue. 
so I could overfill it with epoxy without it spilling out all over the whole surface. Pretty smart, huh? Well, keep watching. The epoxy I used was a 2 to 1 mix, so I poured two parts of resin into the bucket along with one part of hardener. And after mixing it thoroughly, it was time to pour. It was pretty fun to fill up all the cracks in the holes, just not so much fun to pick out all the little floaties that came up. I popped all the air bubbles with a torch, and then I stole my wife's heater so that I could bring up the temperature in the shop to 76 degrees, which is what the instructions said was optimal for the epoxy to set. 2,000 years later. And once it had all dried, I could flip the slab over and attempt to pry off the pieces of chipboard that I had under the two big knot holes. I hot glued all the seams so there wouldn't be any leaks, and I taped the inside of the surface to hopefully let them release a bit easily. Well, no luck. I had to chisel them off piece by piece, but eventually I got the underside of the slab clean and sanded smooth. Now for the top. Remember my genius idea of using the hot glue to dam up the epoxy? Yeah, not so genius. When you attempt to sand through it, the friction liquefies the hot glue, and you end up just gluing your sander to the slab. I had to go around, and I had to chip off every bit that I could. To remove the epoxy above the surface, I started with a card scraper, and that was working fine. It would have just taken me forever, and my little princess fingers were starting to hurt after a while. But eventually, I got it down flush with the slab, and I was able to sand it smooth. I wondered if a hand plane would work better, so I gave that a try, and as it turns out, yes, a hand plane works really, really well. I was able to whittle down all the remaining spots, even the big knothole areas, in just a fraction of the time that it would have taken me with a card scraper. At this point, I could work my way up through the grits while sanding the top. I started at 80 grit, and I ended up at 320, and that left the surface feeling as smooth as glass. And with a sponge attachment, I could easily sand the contours of the edges all the way around. Then, since I wasn't doing a flood coat with epoxy, I polished all the void areas with micro mesh to get them as clear as I possibly could. So for a finish, I'll be using tongue oil from Bumble Shoots as well as some solvent. I just mix them together at a one-to-one -one ratio, and this gets the tongue oil thin enough to really penetrate deep down into the wood, which is good because tongue oil will begin its curing process from the inside and harden as it reaches the surface. This will ensure that the slab should get adequate protection for a long time to come. And since this stuff is so easy to apply, if it ever starts to show some wear, then I can just brush on another coat and then it's as good as new again. Now my neighbor wasn't really using the legs on his kitchen table, so I figured I'd do him a favor and take them off his hands. Now these are hairpin legs, so they're super easy to install. Basically, you just screw them in and you're done. I start out by flipping the slab over and laying them out in the general area where I think I want them. And when things were looking good, I squared them up with one another and then I could mark, drill, and screw them into place. Then, with the help of my better half, I could get this thing flipped over and right side up. And with the new desk in the recording studio, I could load it up with the rest of the stuff that I need to finish it out. I set up my mic, my laptop, I brought in a chair, and I was good to go. Just check out how cool it is now. Isn't that awesome? We started out by making this cool illuminated sign of my podcast logo, and it turned out great. I really like the different LED colors and just how it looks being backlit. Plus, this is a great spot for it since I'll be recording all the future episodes right here. But the showstopper in here has got to be the desk. Man, that thing is gorgeous. For my first attempt at pouring epoxy, I think it turned out great. Sure, it was a learning experience and I'd do it differently if I had to do it again, but still, it's pretty good. And inlaying bow ties was also new to me but I couldn't be happier with how well they look in the end. But just the grain and the character in the slab is amazing. 
and I think the natural looking edge that I carved in turned out pretty cool. Overall, this really turned out to be a beautifully stunning piece, and I'm really, really pleased with it. From the epoxy, to the bow ties, to all the natural character of the slab, I'll probably end up just staring and getting lost in it instead of getting my work done. But speaking of that, it's going to be such a joy to have a proper recording studio now where I can record things, like this voiceover for my YouTube videos. Doesn't it sound good? And of course, recording the podcast each week will be so much easier now that I won't have to sabotage my neighbor's lawnmower any longer. So in case you didn't know, myself and two other YouTubers, Mark Christ from Gunflint Designs and Bruce Ulrich, we have a podcast together. We've had it for years, and it's called We Built a Thing. It's a family-friendly show where the three of us guys, we pal around and we chat about content creation and woodworking and being dads, and we just share funny stories from our past. Now, if that sounds like something that you'd like to check out, then give it a try. And since the show has gotten so popular, you can find us on just about any podcast player there is, or you can even stream it right from my website over at fishersshoponline.com. Well, I sure hope you've enjoyed the video. Thanks so much for watching. Take care, and I'll see you next time. Well, I thought everything was going well, but it looks like I've sprung a leak. Oh, man. Oh, gosh, what am I going to do? Oh. Oh, that's not good. Oh, I'm stuck. Oh, jeez, holy crapskies. That was close. If there was ever any wonder, if I knew what I was doing, this is your answer. Oh boy.